Good morning, church. Uh, so glad to see you this morning. We're going to begin our worship with singing. So let's all stand together as we uh, open up our worship and enter in to praising our God. Waited. We waited for this day, we gathered in your name, calling out to you. The glory like a fire, awakening desire, will turn our hearts with truth. Lord, the reason we're here. God, we do ask that you would open the floodgates, you would peel back the curtain of what is to come, Father, in the new age, when the, we get a new heavens and a new earth and new resurrected bodies. We pray today that you would give us a glimpse of that, Father. We pray that you would encourage us that what is coming is far more important and outweighs everything we see and hear right now in so many ways. God, may we live in light of heaven every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Thanks for being here, everybody. We're glad that you're joining us uh, online. If you're uh, worshiping that way or by way of television, welcome to everybody. If you're in the room, we're glad you're here. And uh, if you are here in the room, we have the blue cards. We'd love for you to fill these out. If you're visiting with us or maybe it's your first time in a long time, we want to know who you are and be able to welcome you. We also want to be able to pray for you. And so if there's something going on in your life that you would like us as a church family to be praying about, write that on here and you can place it at one of the offering uh, t- uh, uh, plates that are at the, the both exits back in the back. And if you're worshiping online and there's something that we can pray for you about, email us here at the church so we can know how to specifically be praying for you. We love you. We're glad that you're here and we want you to know that. Church family, thanks for being a part of worship today as we come before our Heavenly Father and give Him praise. We're going to do a little bit of a, just a quick greeting time, so if you would stand up and pull down your mask and smile at somebody and then put it right back. We're glad you're here today. <laughs> we're going to continue to worship uh, today and Uh, we're going to focus on where we're headed. Amen? We're headed to heaven. Praise the Lord. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I my heart shadows dispelling with joy I am telling he made all the darkness depart heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole my sins were washed away quickly was made when as a sinner I came took of the offer of grace he did proper he saved me oh praise his dear name heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole my sin the passing of time. I 
It's uh, our pleasure to uh, participate in the offertory offering right now. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, bow our heads and talk to our Lord. Almighty Father, we just praise you. Your grace is truly amazing. Father, if we even had an inkling of the idea of how amazing grace <clears throat> your grace is, our lives would be so completely different. But Lord, we thank you that for what we do realize has already changed our lives, and we thank you that you have given us everything we have in addition to our eternal life, your amazing Son, and you've provided for all of our needs, and it is our pleasure and privilege to give you just a small portion of what you've given us back to you. We just pray that you will use it to your honor and glory, that it will achieve exactly what you desire. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 
Our scripture reading is going to be from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 42 to 53. So if you'd like to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles or electronic Bibles, we're going to be reading from the New American Standard Version. I'll give you a minute to turn there. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together, church. Father, thank you for your perfect word. We thank you for this church and all those who give themselves to working for the imperishable. God, we thank you for everyone who realizes that what is here and now is important, but it pales in comparison to what will come. God, we ask today that you would convict each of us and encourage us to be more heavenly minded, that we may be more earthly good. God, we've heard your perfect word, and now, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Well, welcome everybody. We are glad you're here once again, and thank you to all of our worship team. It sounded so beautiful. We appreciate you guys leading us every week with such excellence and allowing us to to really um, just focus our minds, and I think music is special in the way it can take us to a heavenly place uh, in ways that maybe a few other things in this life can. Uh, Christianity is one of the very few singing faiths. Actually, the the Judeo-Christian heritage is the only singing heritage and I really think it's a gift from God that it enables us to, to see Him, though through a, a mirror dimly, though through foggy glass. Well, He's too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Ever heard that? She's just always thinking about the Lord in heaven as if that would do anything. She can't get anything done on earth. Too Heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Heaven. What a topic. We both look forward to it with so much anticipation, and yet we also know relatively little about it, except what God's perfect word teaches us, as in our passage today. A couple of years ago, the media bursts alive, reporting on a false visit to heaven. Nearly five years after it hit the bestseller list, a book that purported to be a six-year-old boy's story of visiting angels in heaven after being injured in a bad car crash was now five years later being pulled off of the bookshelves. The young man at the center said he made up the story. The book, The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, about And I kid you not, a young boy named Alex Malarkey, with the last name Malarkey, somebody should have known something was up, okay. But Tyndale House, a reputable Christian publisher, had called the book a supernatural encounter that will give you new insights on heaven, angels, and hearing the voice of God. Five years later, Tyndale said, the book and all of its products are being pulled out of print because Alex, the boy himself, wrote, this. I did not die. I did not go to heaven. He continued, I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me some attention. 
When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible, he says. He said, people have profited from the lies and continue to profit. They they should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth, said 11-year-old Alex Malarkey, having learned something. He said, anything written by man cannot be infallible, but the Bible is given to us by God. Wow. We flock to the surreal, the sensational, the fantastic, don't we? Others have written books about going to heaven and coming back, and they're almost guaranteed to be instant bestsellers. People eat it up. Now, can God speak through dreams and visions? Can He give people visions of what heaven might be like? Absolutely, yes. The last book of our Bible is a vision of heaven. Revelation, it's being revealed to John. But the plain message of Scripture is so very clear, and we want to interpret the less clear passage and also the fantastic stories that people tell in light of the clear Scripture. Consider with me how stories about trips to heaven relate to the very clear biblical text. And I've given you a few there on your handout, which is uh, on the Facebook account or in your email, or there's uh, paper ones out here if you're here. Listen to these scriptures if you want to go back and look at them later. I've given you the the addresses there. John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. So Christ is the only one who has seen God and reveals God perfectly. Interesting, uh, John, author of 1 John, is also named the Revelator, is one of his uh, descriptions. Kind of like the Terminator, but a little bit different. John sees a vision of heaven, and yet he also says very clearly, no one has seen God face to face. A vision versus face to face seeing is quite different. God says in the very, the very same thing to Moses, Exodus thirty three twenty. God says, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. It's also a great refrain that we hear throughout scripture. I've given you three of the verses there. Isaiah 64, 4, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 1 John 1, 1 through 3. They all say that what no eye has seen, What no ear has heard, nor even the heart of man conceived, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. That means your best vision of heaven isn't good enough. God has conceived of way more than we can think of. God has given us so much more, except Jesus does reveal 100% truth to us. And then 1 Thessalonians, Paul is concerned about the order of the resurrection. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 and 15. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who who have fallen asleep. In other words, there's no out getting out of order in going to heaven. Paul makes very clear that, that we will all go together, and we'll see it again in our chapter. And that really clinches it for me. That if people see Jesus in a near-death experience or see a vision of God, as many others do in Scripture, then it's just that. It's a vision. And we can weigh it against the truth of Scripture, whether or not it's true or not. But they are not seeing God face to face. The Bible makes that very clear. Or back in 1 Corinthians 13, just two chapters before, Paul ends it this way. For we now see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will be fully known, just as I also have now been fully known. Now we all only see dimly, but then face to face. Many, John, Paul, Jacob, and others have seen visions of heaven. And so we can trust that people will see that today, but we can trust that God's word is is trustworthy and will lead us to the truth. We don't have to flock to the, the surreal, the sensational. We don't have to run and grab that latest book off the shelf when there's this book that's been around for a little while. And it knows the truth. Maybe you've read some of those books about visions of heaven or seen the movies. I, 
I can't describe them for you. I've, I've heard that some of them are very, very cute and really great witnesses about Christ. And I would say whatever it's like, however cute, I can guarantee you this, it's still only a passing shadow of how good it will be when Christ comes to gather the redeemed to himself. Those visions of heaven may be very real, and yet it's going to be so much more real. Uh, the scripture promises that. It tells us that our visions of heaven will fall short. And I think really that's more often, it's not that our, our visions of heaven are too fantastic, but it's that our visions of heaven are just for most people, not those who claim to have seen anything, but for most of us, our visions of heaven are kind of boring. Uh, we, we, you know, there might be the occasional fantastic, bizarre, greater than life vision of heaven, but more often we have visions of heaven with angels kind of being chubby and wearing diapers. I mean, come on. That's not, that's not compelling, is it? When people get there, we think, oh, it's kind of like the broken record. We just hear the same thing over and over again. We're just going to worship God as monotonous as it could be. And nothing could be further from the truth. Knowing all the problems in the Corinthian church, everything that we've studied over these last many weeks, the apostle wants to leave one thing in their minds. Heaven. The resurrection of the believer from the dead. And one of the cool things that the apostle does is give us this extended look at what the resurrection will look like. And we can trust this is true. It is God's Word. He's saying that when it comes to human bodies, in Christ, what goes down must come up. Now, I love cycling sometimes. A, a while back, a, a friend of mine pointed out that an author who writes for a cycling magazine actually got published making an outlandish claim about bicycle riding. He said that riders can go into the wind faster than they can go with the wind at their backs. It was trying to claim the opposite of what uh, anybody who lives in Santa Fe in the springtime knows to be true. We can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that article is wrong. Uh, one of my good friends is a PhD professor of engineering and he said this, he also loves to ride bikes, he says, do not believe everything you read. This author cannot change the immutable laws of science. The way friction works and momentum, are they're unchangeable. And frankly, the article just is bogus. Cycling teams spend hours and millions of dollars learning how to reduce the drag created by the wind. They wear these special suits. They shave their legs, even the boys. They do all these different things to make sure that that wind doesn't slow them down. Gravity is a law of science, too. We all get it. If we fall off a ladder, if we try to climb up a mountain, if we jump out of a plane, we all know that what goes up in this world must come down. When it comes to Jesus, he is promising that in Christ, the opposite is true. Paul says Newton's law of universal gravitation that says what goes up must come down does not work for those in Christ Jesus at the resurrection. With Jesus, what goes down will come up. Like we learned last week in what it's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15, Adam is the federal head of mankind. In Adam, all humanity have sinned. The consequences of sin is death, and people will be buried in the ground. Adam brought sin, which brought death, which brought burial. But Christ is the federal head of all those who believe in him. And Christ brings forgiveness, which brings resurrection, which means heaven is a sure reality. Just as inevitable as gravity on earth and death for humans under Adam, so is inevitable the movement under Christ to forgiveness, resurrection, and heaven. What goes down will come up in Jesus. We'll be raised to walk in newness of life. As Christ's tomb is empty, so will be the tomb of the believer. This is the immutable law of the resurrection of the Christian. Now, what's so cool, and we looked at this Easter uh, back in April, are the verses right before verse 42. 
in chapter 15, Paul proves to us that we already believe in science in many resurrections. From science, we believe a whole lot about the resurrection. So it's not a stretch at all to believe in human resurrections. In fact, he says, dead seeds become living plants in verses 36, 37, and 38. A seed becoming a plant is a resurrection of a type, if you think about it. And it is the immutable law of science, too. It's amazing to think this little kernel that had to die can create this huge, massive plant, sometimes huge, massive trees. They can give our bodies food to eat. We can be nourished by that which was dead. It's a resurrection of a type, and it feeds us. Second, all the different animal bodies, verse 39, show how God can make millions of different types of bodies. So, of course, we'll have a different type of body at the resurrection. And finally, 40 to 41, the planetary bodies, the planets and stars above, show us that bodies can shine and have differing degrees of glory, and the stars above can be reborn and teach us again about the resurrection, just like seeds can, according to science. In fact, modern science has only magnified our ability to agree with Paul on these accounts. He is absolutely right. It just proves Paul more and more. So now in our passage, as we come to 42, Paul moves on from explaining how the resurrection can happen and elaborating on it as a, a means of apologetics or giving reasons for his faith, that his faith is reasonable and, and, and full of logic. That's what we talked about at Easter. To now, in these verses, 42 to 53, he's encouraging the Christian church with the idea of the resurrection. He's lifting them up in their spirits. Man, in the middle of the coronavirus, we need to be lifted up in our spirits, don't we? Or if ever there's a good time to meditate on the resurrection today, is a good day. So let's get into what he's saying. He's saying, first of all here, your resurrected body will be imperishable, glorious, strong, and spiritual. Verse 42, this is good news. My daughter is uh, nine, almost ten. Her little legs look like some critter has been chewing on them just from living out summer and being active and fun. She's got all sorts of little bruises and scabs on her, on her legs. My son has a couple of big, bloody strawberries, one on his arm and one on his knee. They are just living out their lives as kids this summer. They're having fun is what those little scars mean. You know what? They're, they're 9, almost 10, and 11, almost 12, and their bodies already show the effects of wearing out. That's kind of depressing if you think about it, isn't it? The little kids. Our new bodies will be imperishable. Imperishable. This is probably the best part of the news. Your resurrection body will not be able to decay or perish. It will not be like the peaches that you spend good money for at the grocery store and in two days they're already bruised and moldy and they've worn out. Maybe you have an ailment in your body right now that makes you just excited about trading in the old model for a new model. I was talking with somebody earlier in the week who was lamenting a friend whose mind is wearing out. I was talking to somebody else this morning who was talking about frustration with, with, with his back and, and taking on cancer treatments. Our bodies are wasting away now. It's a fact of life. But they will become imperishable at the resurrection. It's good news. No more doctor's visits or vitamins or working out. Some will shout for joy to know that there will be no treadmills in heaven. You won't need it. We, they're gone. Everyone will shout for do- joy that because diseases are gone, you can throw off the masks forever. Not only imperishable, but our resurrected bodies will have a glory to them. Look at verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. In context, this means a beauty will be there with your body that has never been there before. Like a spiritual heavenly beauty. So many heavenly beings that appear in the Bible, there is a shining. It says they look like white or they were shimmering. And people are afraid of them before they even say a word, before the being says anything. It's, it's because of their appearance, it has this glory to it. 
And this is saying that our resurrected bodies will have a glory to them. This is really important for us to grasp this. How many people, how many of you, how many of us struggle with our body image? About how we look. About what the mirror tells us. Talking about people spending hours and hours every day in ten thousand dollars or more across a lifetime struggling with this basic question why do i look this bad for others it's the opposite question why do i look this good man their self-hatred their self-idolatry man i'm good and often people vacillate back and forth between the two Here's the thing to know. This world is ravaged by sin and therefore your body will perish one day unless Christ returns first. It is wearing out, period. It doesn't matter how much money we spend on it or how many articles we read. God has ordained death because of sin. Remember last week, though, that's not what we were made for. There's an innate problem with body image in that you were made to be eternal and glorious as you walk with your heavenly Father in the garden in heaven, and yet we all have fallen. So see, the, the, you wrestle with your body image actually goes much deeper than that in that you and I are sinners, and yet we were made for eternity. And at its base, that is what we are wrestling with. I look at myself and I say, I don't want to look that way. I want to look better. I feel something in my soul that cries out for more. Guess what? That is your heavenly Father. He wants you to live with Him forever. But we have fallen. Listen to how image, how we look, plays into the Genesis account of the very first sin. Remember in chapter 1, we looked at this a few weeks ago, God says, let us make man in our image, male and female. He created them in his image. And then over in chapter 3 of Genesis, listen to what it says. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. What a realization that must have been. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the cool of the day and he hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to them and said, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? You see, from the very, the very first reaction to the very first sin is a struggle with body image. Do you see that? And they sew garments and make a covering for themselves out of fig leaves. But what is implied in the Genesis text is that the Lord will slaughter an animal and make garments to cover their bodies. So from the very beginning with the very first sin, there has to be an atonement for that sin. Remember, they were created in the image of God, and it has to do with how they looked. And yet the first reaction is to feel shame in how they look. So there's this contrast between a deep need and a longing for a perfect body on one hand, and the knowledge that will not happen until you receive your resurrected body. In other words, you need to know that your body will not look like you want it to look until that day. We need to face that. Our bodies are wasting away, and that is contrary to how we were made. We're made for eternity. Body image struggles are a homing beacon for eternity. Remember Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has put eternity in the heart of man. Friend, wherever you are, wherever you're hearing my voice, those struggles between what I got and what I want, they go to the depth of your soul. And that God wants you to live with him in perfection, and yet you have fallen from that. But there is good news. There is a resurrected body coming for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus 
Christ. That's what all of this is saying. Man, this is good news for our entire culture, isn't it? Think about how consumed with the human body our culture is. People worship the pretty ones, don't they? Rampant all over our world, it causes all these perversions of the goodness of life that God created for humanity, and we as believers can get just as wrapped up in it. How crazy is it, think about it, that the world is trying to chase youth. People worship these magazine images and actors and actresses, but guess what? Once they're too old, what, are they, what, what secrets of, of eternal youth do they use? What are their secrets of of health and forever? I'll tell you their secrets. They take them off the cover of the magazine. They don't put them there anymore. They trade in the model for one that's younger and younger and younger in order to sell us things that we think will make us look better and better. How ironic is that? And how not true. The secret of their magazine is to replace the older with the younger, not rehab the older. And we need to care for our bodies. That's something really important, but it's kind of like caring for a classic car. It's wearing out. It's getting older. The more miles you put on it means the more sputters and spurts you're going to get out of it. God made you. He loves you. He will renew your body one day into the unique creation of a master craftsman. He understands beauty better than our world understands it. Certainly sin and age come into play with our bodies. What we eat and don't eat, we can make choices that are better for us or not. If we're lazy or not, if we get sick or not, all these factors of a broken world certainly play in to our bodies, don't they? And yes, we must take care of our bodies. The Scripture commands us to. But it also tells us that the only real lasting hope for our bodies comes at the resurrection. All believers in Christ will have a glory to their raised bodies. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. We do not become like God in His glory, but He shares His glory with us in our bodies. Our resurrected bodies will have power. They will have Uh, They will, excuse me, they'll have a glory. They will also have a power. Verse 43, sown in weakness, raised in power. I love uh, when I can, I've been closed forever at the Chavez Center to go and to try to lift some weights. And let me tell you, there are some big dudes that lift weights there. Guys that have muscles on top of their muscles. You're like, how did you get that one up there on top of that one? I don't really understand how that, that came there. But can you imagine in heaven a little girl curling the whole Genevieve Chavez Center, a little nine-year-old. Your resurrection body will have power. You know, men, take care of your body, but just wait till you get your resurrected power. I know, I know you're a tough dude, I get it, but just wait. Finally, it's a spiritual body. We can see from other scriptures that our spiritual body will look like us. We don't have to worry that we're going to look different In the scripture, there are several instances of people who have visions of heaven and they recognize one another. They they know each other in heaven. So we don't have to worry that we're not going to have relationships in heaven. God made us for relationship with him and with each other. And in many of the visions of heaven in scripture, they recognize each other. They know one another. They even recognize people they had never seen before. John is able to say, you know, there's the disciples, there's the apostles, there's, you know, he knew them, but then he's also able to look and see Old Testament characters. Oh, wow. Paul summarizes it this way in verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy. I love that for describing our bodies today. We are earthy, but we will be heavenly, be heavenly. So second, earthy bodies are for earth, heavenly bodies are for heaven. Or earth sort of rubs off on us here. The, the passing of time, the effects of sin, scars and fat cells and being tired and disease, it all begins to show up in the cracks of our eyes and around our midsection and other places. I love the uh, car shows uh, on television where they take these rusty pieces of scrap metal that have been out in somebody's yard and rain and the elements have been falling on. There's holes all in them. And they take them and they rehab them into these beautiful 
creations, functional art. I've, I've learned lots, you know, there's different tastes and preferences and categories in the car restoration business. One is all original. This is actually the most valuable. Uh, these people, uh, they don't want a, a restoration. They want a car that has been barely touched. They want a barely used old car. They want the original paint, not shiny paint. Original engine. Now, if it's shiny and it's original, then it's like, it's, it's worth the millions. It sat in a barn somewhere. Somebody loved and gently rubbed on it all those years, but no one has changed out the engine. These are the gems because the older the car gets, they're just fewer and fewer like that. But that's not my favorite category. My favorite category are the resto mod cars. It means restored and modified. It means they look on the outside like these beautiful old classic cars, but they have the perfectly smooth and shiny body paint. And on the inside, what you don't see, they are powerful. It looks like a 60s Mustang, but instead of 125 horsepower, you get 750 horsepower. You get modern suspension and Air conditioning, I mean, come on, you got to have it all, right? And, and it has brake systems that weren't even invented yet in the 1960s. That's sort of what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Our new bodies will be our bodies, but better. But better. The outside will look better, but the inside will be better. It's got a new engine. It's got stuff inside that can't even exist on earth. I want you to think about how that is not just a great thing to think about. Oh, great, a resurrected body. But think about how that meets the deepest longings of your heart. Every time you look in the mirror, every time you look in an old picture, you kind of give a sigh. It's been a long time. (laughs) God made you that. He made Adam and Eve for that, but they fell from it. We've been wrestling with the ravage of sin for a long time. And Christ has come to deal with sin, and He has started His new kingdom, but He is promising it only gets better. That's what all this is about. And finally, look at what He says about the timing. The change will happen in a moment. As we consider about different views of the end times and revelation, it's important to compare what many different scriptures are saying about the end times, not just looking at Revelation, though it's a very important uh, book of the Bible that deals with the end times. But look at this verse. Look at how it makes it seem so fast. Not like all these events that someone will be able to predict, a decade here, a millennium there, three years of this, four years of that. Look at the speed with me. Look at verse 51. Look at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, so not everyone will die first. But in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. There's a speed Thessalonians talks about this too. Jesus often talks about that the return of Christ will be like a thief in the night. You won't even know it's upon you and it's upon you. A shout, it says here. God descends, the dead are raised, we meet them in the air and it's done. You know what that's telling us? It's telling you and me that we are a moment away from heaven. We are a moment, a twinkling of an eye. I mean, how, how, how do you twinkle your eye? I mean, I, what, I, what I think it is, is that you, you know somebody's eyes are shining and it's light just kind of reflecting off. And often it's, it's because they've opened their eyes and they're smiling. And it's a, it's a flash, right? It's a flash. Now let's think about that sense of timing. What does that teach us? To me, it teaches me to stop fiddling with all the things that don't mean anything eternally. Stop fiddling. But take every minute as one of the greatest commodities that we each have been given. Time is not money. It's more valuable than money. Look at verse 58 with me. We didn't read this one. It's at the very end of chapter 
15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, this is therefore, in other words, in light of everything I just said about the resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That sounds like a guy who knows what it's like to love people, to teach the Bible in connection group, to love kids and grandkids, to share, hey, would you come to church with me? Hey, I've got a message. It's so important. It sounds like a guy who knows what it's like to feel, man, I wonder if I'm doing anything. I wonder if it's having any effect. Do you see what he says? Your toil is is not in vain. Why? What does that mean? Because what it means is that heaven is for eternity. This life is but a breath. And whatever we do that makes its way into eternity lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. And the stuff that we do on this earth lasts for a breath. A breath. There's only two things that are eternal in this world. It's God and people. In the flash of an eye, all will be revealed. In the twinkling of an eye, the only question that will matter is what will we have done that will have eternal significance? Christians are all commanded to be disciple makers. Christians are all commanded to share the gospel, to love the lost in word with the gospel message, and indeed with loving deeds and acts of kindness. All of these we are commanded to make the number one priority of our lives because those things are eternal. You've heard the the phrase, arranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You heard that? You think about what that means. The Titanic's going down and somebody's like, oh, these deck chairs are just out of order. Well, that doesn't matter, man. It's going down. Get in the lifeboat, right? We are called to all sorts of professions and vocations as Christians. But our number one goal should be to get as many people to heaven as possible, period. That is eternal. Because while the other things we do, provide for our families, work on our society. Those are important things. God commands us to do those things. Those are are crucial. But they pale in comparison to who will be in heaven with us for eternity. Remember verse 58. Remember what it said. But thanks be to God. Excuse me. um, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That's the therefore based on all of this resurrection talk. Sharing the gospel in word and deed, making other disciples who will do the same, is the only eternal work we can do. And that whatever our vocation is, whatever, however we make money, under all of it, the real heart is how am I going to get you in heaven with me? How am I going to make that happen? And in a loving way, not a weird way. In a kind way, not an angry way. There's so many strange ways that people have tried to share their faith over the years. But the biblical way is through love. Love in word and love in deed. How am I going to get you to go to heaven with me? I rode my bike um, up the Aspen Vista Trail yesterday. It climbs to the top of the ski mountain. It's really hard. I went really slow. As you're doing that uh, climb on your bike, or maybe you've hiked it or done a hike like this, you look up maybe 50 or 100 yards in front of you, and you see the crest of a rise. And you think, oh good, once I get to that crest, it's going to flatten out, it's going to be easy for a while, oh man, I can't wait till I get up this 50 or 100 yards, and man, it's going to be so nice, until... You finally get to that crest, and you crest that rise, and you look up for another 200 yards of a steeper climb, and you see another crest, and you think, oh man, and you think, maybe, maybe you didn't learn your lesson the last time, and so you think, okay, this time, when I get to that crest, 
it's going to finally be a relief. It's going to be better. It's going to be so easy on the other side of that. And you work harder for the 200 yards and you crest that rise and the trail levels out for five yards. And then you've got another 300 yards to climb this time until on and on and on until you finally reach the top and it feels so good. Victory. Our time on earth is a lot like those periods on the trail. You see a goal in, your, in time, in your life, and it's probably a great goal. People are saying, oh, we need to work for blank. This is the most important goal, this project goal. It is to find a spouse. That's what you really need. Or you need to really get married now. You need to have kids. Or you need this political goal. Or elect this person. Or this work project. I need to make this much money. Or I need to reach partner. Or whatever. People say, get there and you will have succeeded. And as you climb, you put every ounce of energy into pedaling up to that crest. And you reach the crest. You reach the goal. You made it. You did it. And you sigh. And you realize, I live in the same fallen world now that I did at the bottom of the hill. And people can be as mean up here as they were down there. And I feel as much depression up here as I did down there. Until finally, the scripture says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. And then the only thing that will matter is what we've done for eternity. See, according to the Bible, we have to be heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Paul wants people basing their lives on heaven. Why do you think he's concluding his letter this way? He's thinking, what will make this church the most effective people on earth? What will make them walk with God the most? I want to leave their minds saturated with heaven. Then, in heaven, not now, our bodies will work. Then we'll have beauty and power like we have never dreamed. Then, not now, all evil will be killed in an instant. The reality of heaven is the reality that many of our problems, only God can fix. That longing for home that we have felt maybe in a romantic movie or a beautiful piece of music. That's something inside of us that longs for something beyond this life. That's the homing beacon of your heart calling out for God. Friend, will you come to heaven with us? Will you come to to heaven with us? Christian, will you base your life on that day? It will be worth it. As sure as gravity pulls you down now, the resurrected Jesus will be yanking you up then. What goes down must come up in Christ. Let's pray together, church. Father, it's so hard to live in light of eternity because we see so much now that demands our attention. And yet your word is calling our attention to our last day. Father, may we live in light of your word. Would you teach us? God, at the day of the resurrection, would we stand proud? We're going to enter into our time of invitation. And what I'd like to do, as we've been doing, is to have a time of response for all of us. And so if you would keep your head bowed, keep your eyes closed. I want to talk to those of us who have been Christians for a while first. Maybe you've been caught up in the here and now. Maybe somebody's telling you that if, if you don't do everything for that next crest up the hill, you're worthless. But I want to tell you that God's view of time is much longer. Much, much longer. Would you live for eternity? How could you, how could I reorder our priorities such that eternity is in focus every day? 
I want to talk to you if you have never made a decision to follow Jesus. Do you know that the reason that Jesus left heaven and came to earth was to gather his people unto himself? In other words, he came for you. He left perfection and came to a world that you and I, all, we all know, it's a mess, isn't it? But he came to love you. In chapter 14 Jesus of, of John, Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. If you have never trusted Jesus and become a Christian, the way you do that is to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I just believe in you. I believe that you are who you said you are. And Jesus, I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness in my life. Will you forgive me of my sins? I want to be with you forever. And our Lord promises that he will rescue you that you will be in his kingdom forever and ever. I want to invite you right now to make that decision, to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, to trust him. Lord Jesus, this is your world, and you tell us to put the day of resurrection squarely in our minds, to live in light of it. May we do that in Christ's name. Well, church, we have some great things coming up I want to just highlight for you. Uh, For those of you who are here in the church, you can see right there on the front of your bulletin, we've got our family camp coming up. For those of you watching online, I know most of our families are right there today. I just want to point this out to you that you need to go online and register for this. So go to fbcsantafe.com, go to the children's section, click on that. And wait about five seconds, and and it'll pop up, and you'll see you just click on there, and you can register uh, you and your whole family for family camp. We need to know who's coming so we know how much to prepare. So please, if you can do that today, please do that. Uh, Our deadline is actually tomorrow because guess what? It takes a lot longer to get stuff today than it did six months ago (laughs) and so we need to know uh, by tomorrow if you're going to come to family camp Uh, those dates are August 2nd through 5th now on August the 2nd we're going to have a drive-in event and we're uh, we're doing this with uh, three other churches with Christ Church with El Dorado Community Church uh, and with the Blaze Church And we will be uh, doing our pickup of all of our materials and goodies and fun stuff for your family to do for the family camp at Christ Church. And that's going to be at 6 o'clock on August the 2nd. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Drive by and pick up your things and we'll have other other fun stuff there for you. Uh, So please uh, go on, do that today if you can. And then coming up next month, uh, we're going to have a drive-through communion, and that's going to be on August the 21st. 
Uh, we've been doing that on Friday evening for about an hour. And so you'll come, if you want to come uh, take communion, we will do that on that day. And don't forget, if you're not currently involved in a connection group, just email me. I will connect you with someone who leads a connection group at our church and will get you in to a connection group. Uh, my email is john, J-O-H-N, at fbcsantafe.com. And so we'll see you all next week. Thank you, Pastor Reed really is that easy to make sure you're finding connection in the, this quarantine time. Uh, you, it, it's more like Hollywood Squares connection. You're these little two-inch figures on each other's uh, computer screens. But man, I tell you what, it is so great to see each other's faces. You don't have to wear a mask. You have to see the smiles. It's fantastic. Cannot believe that August is already here and we got to start planning for this virtual VBS. We have a communion coming in August. But man, life is a breath, isn't it? Time flies we say. Let's uh, stand together, church family. We'll have our benediction and we'll be dismissed. Father, this life is but a breath. May we be so heavenly minded that we can be some earthly good. For Jesus, you are hope. You are the hope and the light of the world. May we live like we believe that. In the name of Christ, we pray and ask these things. Amen. May God bless you. Have a wonderful day.